In a few minutes, you'll start to use floppy disks and your disk drive. Right now, though, we'll go over the proper way to care for and use disks. Turn the power switch to your computer off for the time being. You'll turn it on again shortly when you start to use disks. For now, though, you'll learn the proper care and handling of floppy disks. A disk drive is a combination input-output device. Programs and data can be read or loaded from a magnetic floppy disk, and programs and data can be written or saved on a disk. The disk drive unit is nothing more than a specially designed tape recorder for handling data. Your IBM personal computer is capable of using an audio cassette recorder to load and save programs and data. Early personal computers depended on audio cassette recorders to store data before disk drives were available. However, because an audio cassette recorder depends on a long piece of tape to record or play back its contents, it takes a long time to read from or write on it. This also makes it difficult to find places on the tape where specific programs were stored since the only reference on a continuous length of tape is the beginning of that tape. Another advantage to a disk system is the capacity of disks. One floppy disk that you will use with your IBM personal computer can hold about as much information as 106 pages of a book. For demonstration only, we have taken this disk apart to show you the inside. We don't recommend that you open a disk yourself because it will ruin it forever. And never touch the disk surface directly. If you do accidentally touch the disk surface, make a backup copy of that disk as soon as you can. Sometimes the oil from your fingers could eventually cause problems with that disk. The floppy disks that you will use with your computer are really just plastic disks coated with a magnetic coating similar to the magnetic coating on an audio cassette. Because tracks can be laid down in a circular manner, side by side on a disk, you get to different sections of the disk very fast. Your IBM uses a technique of laying tracks in such a way as to get the most efficient use of space on the disk. This is called density. The disk you will use should be double density. When you're buying disks, you need to specify double density. To make it even easier to find specific places on a disk, the disk is further divided into sectors by magnetic coating. The coating of the sectors magnetically means that disks for your computer are known as soft sectored. Some disks for other manufacturers' computers use what's known as hard sectored disks. On those, the sectors are identified by a series of holes punched into the disk. When you purchase new disks for your IBM personal computer, you should look for soft sectored double density floppy disks. Hard sectored disks won't run on your machine. In addition, it's possible to save and load data on both sides of a floppy disk. For now, just remember that if your disk drives are 160K drives, you can only use one side of the disk. If your drive or drives are 320K drives, your computer uses both sides of the disk surface. When you're purchasing new blank disks, you must specify that they should be soft-sectored, double-density, double-sided if you're using 320K drives, and soft sector double density single sided if you're using 160k drives actually double sided will work with 160k drives so you're safe with them for either size drive however single sided won't work on 320k machines so you should play it safe and purchase double sided when you need additional discs all disks are permanently enclosed inside of a plastic cover that has access holes in it for the disk drive to make contact with the disk. The disk allows it to rotate freely and helps keep it clean. Disks must be handled with extreme caution. Never write directly onto the plastic cover with a ballpoint pen or pencil. Put no pressure on the cover or the disk itself. The proper way to label a disk is to write on the blank label that is supplied with the disk. Then, carefully attach that label to the disk. When you do attach the label to a disk, make sure that you don't cover the notch on one edge of the disk. That notch serves a very specific purpose that we'll explain later. If you do have to write directly on a disk, use a felt tip pen and write very lightly. Disks should never be placed on or near anything that generates a magnetic or electrical field. Keep your disks away from telephones, television sets, or stereo equipment. 
Don't set your disk on top of your IBM personal computer monitor and don't set your telephone on top of a disk. Don't ever touch the gray or brown surface of the disk itself. Always try to store your disks in the treated paper packet that came with it. It helps to prevent static buildup on the disk, which could then attract dust. And try to store your disk vertically in any one of several holders that are available for this purpose. Extreme temperatures can be dangerous to disks. Keep them out of the sun, as they could warp or lose data. The first visible sign of damage to a disk could be warping or bending of the disk cover. However, the disk could have already lost data if it was near a magnetic field. Disks can last more than 40 hours if a reasonable amount of care is taken with them. 40 hours is a long time when you consider that they're used for only a few seconds when you load or save a program. A disk will operate only if it's inserted in a drive correctly. A good rule of thumb, so to speak, is to hold the disk so that your thumb is pointing at the manufacturer's label as we show here, with the large oval cutout on the top of the disk pointing toward the drive. Then, open the door to the drive and keep the disk as flat as possible. Gently push the disk into the drive until it stops. Never force your disks into the disk drive. If you meet with any resistance at all when you're pushing the disk in, take it out gently and try again. Make sure you're inserting it with the label up and facing away from you towards the drive unit. Once the disk is in as far as it will go, close the door to the drive. Don't force the door closed. If you meet with any resistance, take the disc out and try again. Sometimes, carefully centering the disc inside of the hole in the plastic cover will allow the disc to go in properly after a first attempt has failed. Don't ever insert or remove a disc while a drive is running. You can tell it's running by hearing the whirring and clicking sound coming from the drive or by seeing the red light glow on the front of the drive unit. In order to use discs, your computer needs additional information in its memory. It needs to know how to handle data coming from and going to the disk drive and its disk. And it needs to be able to interpret various languages that the programs contained in that disk may use. In other words, it needs a disk operating system. Some people call it DOS, others simply DOS. We'll refer to the disk operating system in your IBM personal computer as DOS in this video program. Your computer needs to have all of this DOS information loaded into its random access memory before it can let you use a program contained on a disk. But DOS must be loaded from a disk before your IBM personal computer can use a disk. It's kind of a catch-22 situation. In order to use disks, your computer must have some of the information contained on the disk to operate properly. How, then, does it get that very important operating data off of the disk and into its memory? Your IBM manuals call the process of getting DOS from disk into random access memory as starting DOS. Many computer systems refer to it as booting. Starting DOS and booting DOS are the same thing. Both terms are used extensively with computers, and you'll soon run across an instruction in an operating manual that simply says, boot such and such a disk, or start such and such a program. Here's what that means. Let's assume that you have put a specially prepared DOS disk into your disk drive. When you first turn the power switch onto your computer, the drive starts to run. Your IBM personal computer has a program that automatically starts DOS already programmed into its ROMs. That program has just enough information for your IBM personal computer to know where to look for a disk drive and how to read the first bit of data from a DOS disk in that drive. So you have put the disk in and the first little piece of information is found and is loaded into RAM. And all the first piece says is how to load the second piece. And the second piece tells how to load the third piece, and so on, until all the pieces that are necessary are loaded. All the pieces together form what is known as the disk operating system. And so in a sense, it teaches itself how to read itself. It's sort of like pulling yourself up to the moon by pulling on your own bootstraps. Be sure you understand the concept of starting or booting. You'll be asked to boot a disk or to start a disk frequently. Not all disks have DOS on them. 
So not all disks are DOS starters or boot disks. A DOS disk must contain the instructions known as the disk operating system, the program that controls the computer's entire operations with disks in a uniform manner. You have a master disk that contains DOS that came with your system. It is called the DOS diskette. We'll start a DOS disk now. Find the disk that came with your IBM personal computer labeled DOS diskette and insert it into the left hand drive above the keyboard. Close the door to your drive. Now reach around the right side of your computer and turn on the power switch. You'll hear the power supply warm up, then beep for test. Notice the flashing cursor on your screen. Next, you'll hear some clicking and whirring sounds coming from the drive, and the red in-use light will come on the front of the drive unit. This is when the DOS information contained on the disk is beginning to load into memory. DOS is starting. Once DOS is loaded into RAM from a DOS disk, you'll see something like this on your screen. Go ahead and enter today's date by typing the month, followed by a dash, then the day, and another dash, then the year. Then press the Enter key. You could have used slashes instead of dashes and added a zero ahead of single digit numbers as we show here. All of these ways of entering the date would be accepted by your computer. The DOS program will continue to ask for the date until you enter it in a manner it is programmed to recognize. Now the program wants you to enter the time of day. Go ahead and enter the time. You don't always have to enter the date and time when you start your DOS master. You could have simply pressed enter twice and continued. When you've typed the date and time correctly or entered through both, your screen will change and this information will be on your display. The title of the program now loaded into RAM is the IBM Personal Computer Disk Operating System. The next line tells you what version of DOS you have and gives copyright information. The version of DOS is the particular updated DOS program that came with your system. Your version may not be the same number as we show here. You may have a version higher than 1.1. All that means is that the people who write the DOS programs may have discovered improvements that could be programmed in and have put them in and made them available. If you have filled out warranty cards correctly and sent them in to IBM, you'll be notified by mail of the availability of updated versions. The next line is the DOS prompt. You should see the letter A followed by the right angle bracket, then the flashing cursor. The DOS prompt tells you a few things. First, it tells you that it, the disk operating system, is waiting for a command. Earlier, when you did the keyboard exercises, you didn't load DOS from a disk. All you used was what your computer had loaded into active memory from ROM, the language basic, the basic prompt the letters OK were used. OK is the basic prompt. It lets you know that you should respond with a command in basic. Another thing that the DOS prompt tells you is what disk drive is the current disk drive. The letter A simply means that the left hand or A drive is the drive which will take a command. This is also called the default drive. Essentially, a default value is a value that someone who has written the program feels will be the most common value people running the program will use. In this case, the default of drive A is telling you that disk drive A is ready to go to work for you. Defaults can always be changed. In fact, you can change the default value of drive A to assign your instructions to drive B. If you have two drives, type the letter B in upper or lower case, the colon sign, and press enter. Do that now. Now type run and press enter. This time drive B began running and your screen told you there was a disk error. This happened because there wasn't a disk in drive B. If you have only one drive, it would have begun running. Single disk drive systems will default to that drive if you try to give commands to non-existing drives. The error message also gives you three choices to continue. For now, simply press the letter A to abort the command and return to the DOS prompt. 
You can easily change back to drive A by typing the letter A, the colon sign, and pressing enter. Do that now. As you begin to work with your computer, you'll need to go back and forth between drives frequently to save and load data. You have just learned how easy it is to tell your DOS program which drive you want to use. When you started DOS a few moments ago, you had to turn the power switch on after you placed a DOS start disk in drive A. There is another, much faster way to start DOS once you have powered up. Do you remember how to do a system reset? Press and hold down the control key while you also press and hold the alternate key. Then press the delete key. Now release them all. The information on the screen disappeared and your computer acted exactly like it did when you powered up just a moment ago. This system reset is the other way you can start a disk program. You have now successfully started DOS and your disk operating system is ready to work for you. In this chapter, you should have learned how to properly care for and use disks and how to start the disk operating system.